Guys, this morning, uh, I wanted to start just a a little bit different. It's, It's Senior Sunday, and you know, in moments like this, we start to look back at all the decisions we've made. We start to look back at uh, where we are, what place in life we are at. And in these moments, we have an opportunity. We have a, a launching point, if you would, to start a new journey for the future. And it begs the question, am I ready? You know, that's the question this morning that that we're going to be looking at. And I believe our text, God is going to speak that to us this morning. You see, as today we think about celebrations and pivotal moments, God thinks about future celebrations and future moments. While we are thinking about this new season of life, this new transition, this new opportunity, God thinks about all of the seasons of our lives, all of the opportunities, and all of the transitions that are to come. While we are sitting here and we're trying to think through, man, what's the fall going to look like, parents, students alike, what is the summer going to look like, what's tomorrow going to look like, let's be honest, what am I going to have for lunch? In that same moment, God is thinking as he looks at your and my life, he's thinking these things, he's saying, I want to build something significant in them. I want them to become men and women that are rooted in me, built up in truth, faithful in all things. A generation that sets the example for generations to come. A generation that will live a life that stands the test of time. Lives that won't weather a day, a week, or a year, but lives that That when storms come, when the wind blows and the flood takes place, they will stand until the end of time. So this morning, the parable that we look at, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. So if you have your Bibles, uh, will you turn with me there to Luke chapter 6? And if you're able, I ask that you would stand as we... Read God's word. And in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 46, this is what it says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house, and it could not shake it, for it was well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great." Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I just want to once again come before you. And God, as we just look for a moment at this passage, we look at this parable, and God, as we apply it to our life, I pray that once again you would just, you would use me, that you would use the preparation, and God, that you would use your word to speak to our lives and to give us application for today and for the future. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We ask these things in your precious son Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, for some of you, you know that I have a daughter. Um, I have a beautiful, energetic, sometimes uh, seemingly shy. That just means you don't know her fully. But I have a three-year-old daughter named Heidi. And Heidi is at a very fun age. Now, Seniors aren't in here, but students that are in here, that is parent talk for we have no clue what today will be like. It means that we might have a very, very good day, and we might have a very, very bad day. But regardless of the day, there's one thing that is always true about Heidi. She absolutely loves the game hide and seek. She loves it. And I think as her dad, one of the things that I love more than anything else is when it's her turn to count. 
Not because she's a, a great counter or a great seeker. Not because um, it gives me the opportunity to go in solitude while she runs around the house. But because while she counts to 10 most of the time, she only makes it to three or four. And it sounds a little something like this. One, two, three, four. And then you hear the famous words, ready or not. This morning, we're going to answer that same question. And my hope is that through this parable, we can answer to ourselves today, are we ready or not? You see, here's the thing. Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount with this parable. He, he takes a, a look at all that is in his Sermon on the Mount, and he finishes out with this idea of a wise and a foolish builder. And if we look back at verse 46, he says this. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? You see, in, in Matthew's account of this parable, Matthew gets done telling the, the story or, or telling um, the teaching that Jesus has just done, saying that not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And, and Luke, in same fashion, says this statement, not everyone who is calling me, Lord, Lord, is doing what I'm telling them to do. You see, it seems like something that should be fairy tale. Why would somebody ever proclaim Jesus but not follow his commands, follow his teaching? But the sad truth is that's probably more the norm than the exception to the rule in today's society. There's a lot of people who proclaim Jesus and fail to receive his message. So this morning, I want to look at three major things to, to see and to check our readiness. And our first point in checking our readiness this morning is we have to know the message of Jesus. We have to know the message of Jesus. Now, to understand this, we have to backtrack a little bit and just basically summarize uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us a, a multitude of things. But the primary thing that he's getting at is uh, what it is or what it means to be a Christ follower, or in today's standards, we would say a Christian. Jesus gives us uh, the Beatitudes, and he gives us uh, many other teachings within this sermon. And some of those teachings, we see that he tells us, he calls us to humility. He says we must humble ourselves. We must be poor in spirit. We must mourn over our sins. You know, one of the things that we need to understand as, as being a Christian or a follower of Christ is we have to see ourselves as God sees us. Sinners. Broken. In need of a Savior. You see, in the, in the message that we have that Jesus gives, it, it, it has this ongoing theme of a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Righteousness that we can never obtain on our own. Righteousness that, that doesn't come by human hands, but can only be satisfied through Christ. And so when we understand that, we understand that there has to be a transformation, <clears throat> a renewing of our hearts and our minds. Jesus taught, that as that transformation takes place, as we are renewed in heart and in mind, we become a light into the world. We become men and women that not through works, but through the action of the message, reflect people back to the kingdom of God. Not through being a good person, but through being a person who follows Christ regardless the circumstances or consequences. One of the greatest teachings that we see here is he goes back and forth between an internal and an external conflict. 
He completely shatters what the previous viewpoint of the laws were. Because what he says is, it's not about the external keeping of the laws. While that is well and good, and you should do that, it's more of an internal uh, desire. It's more of a heart-based faith. And he says it reflects directly into your sin as well. Because he tells us sin's not something merely that's external. You can be a quote-unquote good person, but I don't know anything about your thoughts, your desires. And that is where sin originates. is in our thoughts, in our desires, in the things that internalize and eventually become external. You see, Jesus teaches us that our words matter and that as disciples, we must be mindful and readily available to have an account for those words. You see, he tells us that we must be loving, forgiving, forgiving, compassionate, faithful, trusting, and that our will is for the righteousness of of the kingdom, and our priority is to live that life. James gives it to us in a slightly different way, and James, he's kind of smack you in your face uh, mentality when he writes, but in James chapter 1, James gives us a a similar kind of viewpoint as this parable, because James, he writes and he says, hey, look, here's the thing. You can't be hearers only, but you must also be doers of the word, and then he paints a picture for us. And he says, for, for example, if a man were to walk up to uh, a mirror, and in all honesty, that probably doesn't apply to the men in this room, but ladies will talk to you. If a wet lady were to walk up to a mirror and look into it and walk away and forget exactly what she looked like, it would kind of be pointless, correct? He said, this is what those who are hearers only are like. They come, they look briefly for an hour, maybe two, on a Sunday or Wednesday, and then they leave never changed. He said, if you want to see somebody who is a hearer and a doer of the word, that is the person, that is the lady or the man that wakes up, they look intently into the mirror, they try to memorize the face, they see the wrinkles, they see the, the, the little spots, they see the, the beauty marks, they see the, the color of the eyes, they make sure that they know where every lash and hair is and they memorize it. And James says, this is the depiction of someone who not only hears God's word, but applies God's word. Not only somebody who is a hearer, but someone that is a doer. It's a solemn call to devotion, a commitment to discipleship. And make no mistake, it's all revolving around knowing the message of Jesus. As he continues in the parable, verses 47 and 48, this is what it, he says. Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man who is building a house, who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and it could not shake it. Because it was well built. You see, the call here is to a response. It's not merely to know God's word, but it's about a response of God's word. And and the response of knowing God's message is what brings us to our second checking point. The checkpoint number two to see if our readiness is there is we have to respond to his message. You see, it's, it's not enough merely to know. God calls us throughout Scripture to be obedient. You see, Jesus tells us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the work of the Father. You see, here's the the emphasis. The um, emphasis is upon the response to the gospel and not merely knowing the gospel. Often, 
we tend to know a lot more than we practice. Churches are full of people who know the gospel. But do we as professing Christians live out the gospel? You see, it's not about the knowledge of truth, but it's about the application of truth. Too often people find themselves searching. They want to know more. They want to have a deeper um, understanding of Scripture, and that's good, and that's, that's an amazing thing. But as they search for something deeper, they misunderstand knowledge for application because the truth of the gospel comes by action. And so their understanding of it is never practical or experiential. It's only a surface level. You see, the issue is that we have yet to respond. Jesus says there's only two responses, and he tells it in this parable. He says there's one response that says you will hear and you will obey, and inevitably there's the opposite. The other response is to hear and to disobey, to continue on without any change. Here's the problem with that. Knowing's not sufficient. Being a good person, it's not enough. Showing up for life group and Sunday morning worship, while this is a good thing, and we definitely encourage it, especially here at Indian Springs Baptist Church, those things in and of themselves will not get you to heaven. Those things do not secure your eternity. Those things are not enough. You see, the difference between a disciple who merely claims to be a follower of Jesus and a disciple who obeys and puts into action, Jesus calls that person a wise man, a wise person. Someone who can stand the flood, the wind that blows, the storm that weathers. Their foundation stands strong. Those who hear, though, and for whatever reason they fail to obey, they fail to respond, well, Their time is short. Their outcome is, is inevitable. You see, when your life is transformed by His power, when the Holy Spirit forever changes your heart, you can't help it. Actions will change. Response will take place. And Jesus is telling us this is the authenticity of your discipleship, of your proclamation that you are a Christian. If we do not love our neighbor as ourself, if we do not forgive as we have been forgiven, if we're hypocritical and judgmental, if we hold anger and resentment in our heart, if we do not love as we have been loved, it doesn't matter what we claim to be. Our claims fall short and we are not his disciples because his disciples practice what he preached. Knowing that, we know that salvation is not through works, but works become the evidence of your salvation. And that this morning is where we find ourselves at our third point. Probably one of our most important points. But the third point is this. To check our readiness, we have to know the results. The results of our obedience. Look again at verses 48 and 49. And he's talking about the wise builder in the first part there. He says, he is like a man who built a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house 
and could not shake it. Listen to this part. Because it was well built. The foundation was strong. But one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. The results are clear. There's a stark contrast between those who hear and obey and those who choose to hear and go their own way or disobey. Those who hear and obey, they have eternal life and there will be nothing that will change that. They have a foundation that will stand the test of time. They have a future that is secure. But those who disobey, those who build their house on sand, whatever they have built, it's not going to stand the test of time. You see, in this world, everybody's building something. This morning, we are all building something. Some of us are building lives that will last. Some of us are leaning towards the obedience and the lordship of Jesus. But then others, we aren't. We haven't listened to the call of his spirit. We haven't acknowledged him as Savior and Lord. You see, we like a Savior. We like somebody to save us. It's the Lordship that scares us to death. You see, when people build on a rock, they build with solid material, indestructible material. Other people in their life, they build on things that don't last. They build on possessions. They build on society's worth. You put value in things that will decay. You know, here's the thing. I found something very, very interesting as I was preparing and as I was reading about this parable. You see, Jesus, when he was telling this parable, he was more than likely near this town um, called Bethsaida. And in this town at Bethsaida, this was a fisherman town. Honestly, this town, it should have been renamed to the Tom Williams capital of the world. Because if you look at the original Hebrew, this place, and Tom, I'm telling you, this is your retirement home. It's called, it literally translates to house of fishing or place of hunting. Couldn't find a better place for Tom. Tom. But as he's preaching, this is a very small fishing village, and it's right between the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. And the people of this time and this town of this time, they understood very well about the seasons. They knew that there was really only two primary seasons. There, there was a harsh winter that had flooding and cold temperatures, and there was a equally harsh, scorching summer that brought drought and low waters of the Jordan. And so every year it was inevitable what would happen is as the Jordan would flood, it would leave behind in the summer these large pathways of flat, seemingly good foundations right next to the Jordan River. And if you were just passing through if you were wanting a vacation home, it was pretty enticing to come in and say, man, I didn't have to do any excavation. This is perfect. I've got riverfront property and it's ready to build. So they would come in and they would build and everybody in town would say, man, they're missing the mark. They got no clue what's coming down the line. Too often... That is the foundation we choose to build on because it's easy. It's complacent. It's convenient. You see, here's the thing. The people who lived there, who devoted their time to the craft that was the Jordan River, they knew that this wasn't a good place to build. 
And so they directly related to this story. You see, here's the thing. This morning, you can look around and we love to compare. And I'm sure in that day and time, they did too. From the surface, the house on the sand and the house on the rock, they probably look very similar physically. In your life, you probably know people who are like, man, they're good people. Are they? Externally, it's hard to tell because there's so many similarities. It's not until the foundation is tested that you will find out what the structure's made of. You see, here's the thing this morning. It's easy to fool people around you. It's easy to put on an external face. It's not so easy to fool God. You see, he knows what's on the inside. He knows what your foundation is made of. People who choose to build on poor foundations, on unstable ground, Eventually, the changing sands of humanity will leave them, just as the parable says, with imminent failure. It won't last. And the fall will be great. So let me ask you a couple questions this morning as we close. Upon what are you building your life today? Are you building your life on the solid rock that can only be found in God's word? Are you using materials that come from the actions and obedience of being faithful to God? Will what you build stand the test of time? Or perhaps this morning, deep down within, as you've heard this, you understand what I am professing And what I truly possess, two different things. The kind of individual that I am, I am ashamed to say it, but if I were revealed, I would be false. My foundation is weak. Perhaps this morning, you know that you're not being obedient to the message of Jesus. Everybody else around you, they look, they see you, and it looks fine. Everybody looking in said, man, that's a good old guy. She's a good old girl. They're great, but inside you know that's not true. That's not who I am. Like I said earlier, it's easy to fool others. You can't fool God. And if you're honest with yourself, you really can't fool yourself. So maybe this morning, God's calling you to commit yourself fully. Not just to a Savior, but to a Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never given your life and your heart to Jesus. And this was exactly what you needed to hear. This was exactly the place you needed to be. Because it's for the very first time ever, you saw yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior. If that's you this morning, that's what this time is for.